Hello biology students, this is Mr. Gales and today I'm bringing you biotechnology screencast session number five. This is the last screencast for the biotechnology unit and today we're going to focus on stem cells. Stem cells are interesting because they're in the news quite a bit lately and I think a lot of people have a lot of misunderstandings about what stem cells really are and what they can do. So we're going to begin by talking about some of those people that are in the spotlight that stem cell research has become a cause for. These are some celebrities that you may find uh, familiar who have become proponents of stem cell research. Now obviously those that are still living here are current proponents. Um, these are people for instance like Michael J. Fox who is uh, a very famous movie actor. He was in Back to the Future. You guys all probably saw that. Michael J. Fox was diagnosed with parking, Parkinson's disease several years ago. This is a disease which affects the neurons in his nervous system. Um, he's a huge proponent of stem cell research because of the promise of the potential of regenerating damaged and destroyed neurons. Similarly, before his death, this is Christopher Reeves who played Superman in the 1980s versions of the movies. He had a spinal cord injury and he was a big proponent when stem cell research first really became uh, into the, in, came into the forefront. He was really uh, interested in, in the possibility of stem cells being used to essentially reverse spinal cord injury. Now there are other people like for instance who suffer from diabetes. Diabetes is a very common genetic disease which theoretically or potentially could be treated using stem cell research and there are, are uh, celebrities like Holly Berry uh, or this is Tommy Lee from the band Motley Crue who have type 1 diabetes and who are very interested in seeing stem cells used for uh, research. So this is a, a topic that's in the news quite a bit and you've got people that are, are famous who are putting a lot of their weight behind stem cell research. So let's talk a little bit about what stem cells are. What we're going to begin with is an animation which will take you through uh, a description of what stem cells are, how stem cells are derived, and then ultimately what can be done with them. We're also going to be looking at in this animation uh, really the the differences in the way that the stem cells are, are harvested and why those differences are important for treatment. So we're starting off with a picture which shows the hierarchy of stem cells and this will be described in the animation. So I'm going to pull up the animation and from now on I'm just going to go ahead and play this animation. You guys can watch this and then after the animation we'll talk about some of the main ideas that were discussed. Stem cells can be obtained from many sources, but not all stem cells are equal. Some stem cells are said to be pluripotent, that is, they have the ability to develop into many different cell types of the body. Others are more restricted in the types of cells they can become. Embryonic stem cells, the most pluripotent of all stem cells, are derived from embryos generated by in vitro fertilization. When fertilization is successful, the sperm head bearing the nucleus enters the egg while the tail is left behind. The fertilized egg divides first into two cells, then into four, and so on. By about five days after fertilization, a multicellular ball of cells known as a blastocyst is formed. Looking inside the blastocyst, we can see that it's a hollow ball made up of two cell types. An outer layer called the trophoblast eventually forms the placenta. An inner cluster of cells known as the inner cell mass becomes the embryo. The inner cell mass consists of embryonic stem cells. It's possible to pick up these embryonic stem cells with a pipette and transfer them to a petri dish for culturing. Colonies of cells that result can be further propagated by transferring them to new petri dishes. Under appropriate culture conditions, these embryonic stem cells divide or self-renew and the cell mass grows. By adding the appropriate signaling molecules, Cells can also be coaxed into differentiating into a particular specialized cell type. Groups of cells may develop properties of mature bone cells or of pancreatic cells. Others develop into muscle cells that can contract and still others into nerve cells. The goal of cell replacement therapy is to use these cells for transplantation 
to replace tissues and to restore function. Because they have the potential to become such a wide variety of specialized cells, embryonic stem cells are described as pluripotent. Pluripotency is one of two key features of embryonic stem cells. The second key feature of embryonic stem cells is their ability to self-renew indefinitely while retaining their undifferentiated pluripotent state. Small groups of cells are placed in petri dishes to divide. Cells from a single petri dish can seed many petri dishes. In this way, unlimited numbers of undifferentiated pluripotent stem cells can be produced. When transplanting ES cells derived from embryos obtained by in vitro fertilization, the genetic background of the ES cells in the dish will be different from the genetic background of the patient. Therefore, the tissues and organs derived from these cells will also have a different genetic background from the patient, and this can lead to rejection of the transplanted tissues. The technique of somatic cell nuclear transfer, or SCNT, might eliminate this problem, allowing for the generation of replacement cells that have the same genetic makeup as a patient. In somatic cell nuclear transfer, the nucleus of the egg is removed, and with it, the genetic material of the donor. Next, a biopsy is taken from the patient, for example, skin cells, and the nucleus from one of these cells, bearing the patient's genetic material, is transferred into the empty egg. Following activation, the same sequence of events shown earlier takes place in a culture dish, ending up with ES cells, except that the ES cells have the same genetic background as that of the patient. In the same way, patient-specific ES cell lines may someday be produced and used to generate cells and tissues for transplantation. The point is that these cells, tissues, and organs will be genetically compatible with the patient and will not be rejected. In addition to generating cells for tissue and transplantation, it is hoped that by using ES cells derived from patients with known genetic defects related to ALS, Alzheimer's disease, or Parkinson's, researchers will be able to develop and test drugs that might prove valuable in the treatment of the disease. All right. So that's a, a really nice introduction for you, an overview on stem cells, what the stem cells are and where they come from. Um, let's wrap some of that up here. Stem cells are cells that are what are referred to as undifferentiated. They have not yet gotten their purpose. These are well, if you blank slate cells, if you will, they can become any kind of cell. So we would say that stem cells are still able to differentiate to become many different cell types. Um, and as you saw at the end of the animation there, stem cells are important because they could be used to aid our understanding of diseases and potentially derive treatments for diseases. Or we can be, eventually there's potential where we could use stem cells to replace damaged cells or organs. For instance, uh, neurons that have been damaged as a result of spinal cord injury or stroke could be replaced using uh, stem cells that would generate new nerve cells. Now, where do the, st the stem cells come from? We saw in the animation, uh, they talked a lot about something called a blastocyst. This is the normal course of human development. We have fertilization where the sperm and the egg fuse together. And the very first cell that forms is called a zygote. Now, a zygote will begin to divide. And as it divides in the first, very first few divisions, it forms what's called a morula, which is that initial ball of cells. Those cells, cells are referred to as to totipotent, think totally potent. They can generate the entire new organism in addition to any other stem cell tissues that are, that are produced. Now that is only possible in that very early stage development. Now after a few more days, we're talking about up to about five days, after about five days, we have what is referred to as the embryo. Uh, the fancy name for embryo is blastocyst. This is a concept that you're going to want to make sure that you have a, a good understanding on. Um, the blastocyst is made up of the outer ring of cells and then the inner cell mass. And you can see the inner, inner cell mass here. Uh, 
Blastocysts are up to about 200 cells. Um, there is no nervous system. There is no heart. There's no lungs. It is just a collection of cells. It would be very difficult for you to tell the difference between a human blastocyst or the blastocyst of any other animal. Now, in the course of normal human development, that blastocyst, as it begins to divide in those cells, the inner cell mass, those are the stem cells, they will form the different kinds of tissues and cells and organs that make up the fetus, which would be what we would begin to recognize as being human, and then obviously eventually our person would be born and, and go through full development. Um, now, those stem cells that are found in the blastocyst are what we would refer to as embryonic stem cells. There are different types of stem cells that are currently being investigated. The two major types are embryonic stem cells and adult stem cells. Embryonic stem cells are those found in that inner cell mass of the blastocyst. It is really crucial to know that they are completely undifferentiated. So in other words, they are pluripotent. And that means that they can become all different cell types. The importance of pluripotent cells, as you can see here, right, because we're talking about these pluripotent cells that are from that blastocyst, not only can they become all different kinds of stem cell types, but they can regenerate themselves. So once we have a line of these pluripotent stem cells, we can propagate that line and have more of them. That's a, a real advantage in the research. Uh, the other type of, of stem cells that's being researched are adult stem cells. Now, adult stem cells can be taken out of adult patients. Um, for instance, in the marrow, in the, in the bone marrow, we can find blood stem cells. Um, these are stem cells that have the ability to, to differentiate into different kinds of tissues related to their purpose. So blood stem cells, you can see here, would be able to produce new red blood cells and new white blood cells, but they would not be able to produce all of the different kinds of cells that the body is, it uses. Uh, adult stem cells are sometimes referred to as multipotent because they might have many different types of cells that they can form, but they're not pluripotent. They cannot form all different kinds of stem cells, and they can also not self-propagate in culture. So embryonic stem cells really has been the focus of most of the research over the last 10 years or so, although there is growing interest in adult stem cells, and we'll be talking about them a little bit more in class. Uh, so we're going to focus a little bit more here on embryonic stem cells since they seem to be the ones that have a little bit more biological function here. Um, the picture that you're seeing here, we're going to start off with our blastocyst, which remember is about five to seven days old, made up of, you know, up to about 200 cells. And the important part is going to be the inner cell mass, which would be removed from the blastocyst and then cultured in dish. Now these stem cells that are produced, these are the embryonic stem cells from the inner cell mass, are completely undifferentiated. They're pluripotent, which means that they can make more of themselves and they can make different kinds of specialized cells, including blood cells, neural cells, and muscle cells. So we're essentially removing the inner cell mass and the embryonic stem cells from that blastocyst area. Now there are different sources for embryonic stem cells. One source of embryonic stem cells would be uh, using embryos that were produced through in vitro fertilization. Um, that's one major way and also through therapeutic cloning which we've been talking about in class. Uh, in the picture here you're seeing um, this would be a, a, an apparatus for storing embryos. Now people that have difficulty conceiving naturally can have what's called in vitro fertilization or, or what is commonly referred to as a test tube baby. This would be where an egg would be removed from the woman and a sperm sample would be collected from the man or there might be a, a sperm donor. And these two would be essentially mixed together in a, a petri dish. Fertilization would occur outside of the body. Um, and generally when they do this, they're going to make several embryos and they're going to pick the one or two that seem the strongest to reimplant into the woman. So there are going to be leftover embryos, oftentimes many leftover embryos during the IVF process, and these would be frozen. Sometimes they are um, frozen for if the couple decides they want another child at some later point in time. Um, but oftentimes what happens with these is they're just discarded over time. They, they essentially become biological waste. And so some of them are used as uh, research tools for embryonic stem cell research. Now, the other major way that we can get embryonic stem cells is through therapeutic cloning. And you'll remember that therapeutic cloning involves what's called somatic cell nuclear transfer. This is where we take a patient's own somatic cell and we would take a, a nucleated 
egg or a, an egg from a donor, remove the nucleus, we would transfer the nucleus of the somatic cell into the egg, forming essentially a blastocyst, which we would remove the embryonic stem cells from. And then those stem cells could be cultured and then chemically treated to become any different kind of cell that we need. So those are the two major sources of embryonic stem cells currently. Um, both of these have their um, ethical considerations. This is a, a major question in biology right now and also in society. To what extent should we be doing this kind of research? There's lots and lots of promise with embryonic stem cell research, but there's also that concern that it does destroy that blastocyst, which is that early stage embryo. This picture uh, contrasts the IVF process with the somatic cell process. The image across the top shows you what would occur in in vitro fertilization. So in in vitro fertilization, there actually is a sperm and egg that would meet, um, and it would form that early totipotent ball of cells, which then develops into the blastocyst. Now here, this is where we would stop. We would prevent the blastocyst from being reimplanted into a woman for pregnancy, and we would use those cells um, to produce a culture of pluripotent stem cells that could then be used for research. Now, as you saw in the animation, one of the downsides of using in vitro fertilization as a source of um, embryonic stem cells is that they are not histologically compatible with a patient. In other words, any tissues, cells, or organs that are grown from this combination uh, would not necessarily be genetically compatible with the patient where they're going to, and that can cause uh, immunity and rejection of tissues. Uh, and other problems like that. So one way to get around that would be to take, um, if you're a patient who's in desperate need of some sort of transplant or of some sort of new cell line procedure, we would be able to take a cell from your own body and using somatic cell nuclear transfer, we would transfer the contents, the genetic contents of that cell into an enucleated egg like you see here. That means having the nucleus removed. And that it would essentially produce a, a clone of of the patient, of you, um, those cells would, would begin to divide. We'd have that early totipotent cell mass, which then would form into the blastocyst. The blastocyst at that point would be broken down to extract the uh, embryonic stem cells. And the value here is those cultured pl pluripotent stem cells would be completely immunologically compatible with uh, the patient that would be receiving them for treatment. So two different ways of, of getting these cells and kind of some of the considerations that relate to each of them. Now, I mentioned before that there is a lot of promise regarding stem cell research. There's also those ethical questions that we need to consider, but let's take a look at some of these different ways that we could use stem cells. We already talked about how stem cells could be used to identify drugs and other treatments for uh, diseases. Right? We can understand uh, genetic disorders more readily when we are able to watch the cells actually get sick in real time. Um, we can test toxicity right, of certain chemicals and make sure that the chemicals that we're using to treat diseases do not cause cell death. Uh, and then we can study cell differentiation and better understand how we would be able to prevent uh, diseases and, and better treat things like birth defects. But I think probably the most direct usage for stem cells is down in here where we can actually develop new cells and tissues to replace those that have been damaged. Now here we have pancreatic islet cells. Pancre pancreatic islet cells are the cells that produce insulin. So for a diabetic, these are absolutely critical. And if we could replace the, the damaged pancreatic cells with fresh new pancreatic islet cells that produce insulin, we could essentially cure diabetes. Think about people that have heart disease, chronic heart disease, or massive heart attacks and survive. Stem cells could theoretically produce new heart muscle cells to repair that damage. Nerve cells for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease, and then bone marrow for leukemia and uh, chemotherapy patients who have a lot of their uh, uh, blood cells damaged through the process of the treatment. So a huge amount of upside here with stem cell research, being able to treat lots of different kinds of diseases. Now, the big question, of course, becomes where do we draw the line? Do we do this kind of research? And that's what the big argument is in society. So if we look at this picture, this again looks at the somatic cell nuclear transfer process used to ultimately produce embryonic stem cells. If we prohibit all cloning, reproductive cloning and therapeutic cloning here, this would obviously restrict therapeutic uh, pr uh, applications of, of this kind of process. This essentially would stop 
um, a, a, a very wide range of the kinds of um, procedures that we would be able to do or the applications that we would be able to come up with involving stem cells. Now, if we allow for therapeutic cloning, if we allow for the somatic cell nuclear transfer to occur and we prohibit the implantation of the blastocyst, what this does is it prohibits reproductive cloning, but it allows for therapeutic uh, research so that we can develop treatments and cures. I think that um, right now there is a fairly strong feeling in the scientific community, particularly in the medical uh, com community, that this is probably where we need to go, right? That we're not crazy about the idea of having reproductive cloning with humans, but that therapeutic cloning has a tremendous amount of upside and that it perhaps is a worthy um, way of using those cells. You need to consider, is that blastocyst of the same moral standing as a person who needs that treatment? today. And that's a question that we're going to go further into in class. One other thing we're going to be talking about in class over the next couple of days are some newer developments regarding adult stem cells and what are called induced pluripotent stem cells, which come from adult cells. So hopefully you understand a little bit more about stem cells now and you're ready to discuss these things in class. So until I see you again in biology, this has been Mr. Gales and we'll see you next time.